Okay, we're almost there. And there we go. Okay. So let's make sure that it's uh, that we're all working. Are we working in Zoom? Can you hear us, Jessica? Can you hear us? Everything's loud and clear. Okay, excellent. Um, as well, let's just make sure that we're working on Facebook. Can you let us know uh, if you can hear us on Facebook? Just give us a comment, if you will, and that will uh, allow us to know that we can get moving. Okay. And last but not least. Okay. Just let us know. Um, if everyone can hear us, then we can actually just get started. Uh, we've got good sound on Facebook. We have good sound on Zoom. And uh, just let us know on Instagram. Just push a bunch of likes and let us know if you can hear us there. And if you can, we can get started straight away. Uh, yeah, or just maybe someone. Yeah, okay, excellent. We've got the uh, we've got the universal sign, the likes that help us understand uh, whether or not we uh, we can be heard. Okay, one second. Let's pull that up a little bit. And we are good to go. All right, let's turn that that way, and we're ready. Fine. So first of all, um, we just want to welcome everyone back. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We have uh, uh, the classes dedicated this week in honor of uh, Rabbi Shlomo Farhi. Again, thank you so much. There's uh, so many so many honors. It's so beautiful. I appreciate the appreciation. For the Rifuah Shalema of Rose Rezel Chaya, Bat Chava, and um, Marco Mordechai ben Jamile, Yaakov Israel ben Chaviva, Benjamin ben Jun Esther, and Rav Yoshua Yosef Pinto ben Zari, and as well Lilu Nishmat, Rahel bat Sofi Shefie, Rabbi David ben Rivka, Shilomo ben Rivka, Rachel bat Yafa, and Yitzchak ben Lucy by Anonymous. So it's a, a wonderful, wonderful opportunity um, to uh, to have everybody here, here together with us and to listen in. To the words of Torah, I uh, I am very very grateful that we have everyone with us. Um, let's begin uh, this week's parasha. So, um, the the parasha that we're reading this week is the parasha of Naso, which literally means to count. But there's something very interesting about this parasha. If uh, if you let me, uh, if you let me talk about it, which brings us to the topic of tonight, which is loving your place. The idea is uh, sometimes that people are not always sure what I mean when I give these uh, these topic names, and on some level that's that's okay, like it's all right for you not to know. Um, but on the other hand, you know, obviously you'd benefit if you understood exactly what I was trying to communicate. So hopefully we'll try and do a combination of of those two things. Now I don't know about you, but for me, and I think for most people, there's a bit of fatigue from what's going on in the news. I don't know, tell me if, if you feel the same way. I know that I feel that way. That there's a constant conversation and it's focused, or it seems to be focused at least, only on what happens to be going on at that specific moment in time in, uh, in the world. So for two months plus, we spoke only, everyone spoke only about Corona. Every post was either a post telling you you're going to die from Corona, a post telling you who did die from Corona, a post telling you who was sick from Corona, a post telling you how you could get cured from Corona, or then started the memes, 
right? Making fun of Corona, you know? So this is how it was. And then what happened? Right smack in middle, right as we're about to open up, uh, a new ball game comes to town. The ball game of, of, uh, of George Floyd. And suddenly, the new conversation is only about George Floyd. It's actually fascinating. I don't know if uh, any, any of you does this. When I want to read the news, so I don't like reading the news from one source. I feel like you're getting gypped. Someone is lying to you. Someone is giving you their agenda. I like to read the news from multiple sources to be able to get what I think is a little bit more balanced perspective and to figure out what I think the story is and not what uh, that specific news station thinks the story is. So if you go on to Google, you can Google news and it will bring you news from a bunch of different sources, from Fox, from CNN, from, uh, from what's it called, from, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, P- The Beast, from Slate, from all random bits of news from all around. And hopefully, if you read a little bit from all different sides, you kind of get... But what's interesting to me is that it seems as if the only thing that is going on in the world is illness. And the only thing that's going on in the world is racism or protesting or looting. But actually, do you know what? You and I are still married to husbands and wives. You and I still have children. You and I, hopefully, still have some sort of business. You and I still have, hopefully, children to educate. You and I still have dreams and visions for what we want for ourselves, for our community, for our people. And it's almost as if everything else in the world just decided to go on break because there's a news cycle that's talking about something else. Now, actually, there's a fascinating terminology for this. In, uh, in the world of psychology. And in the world of psychology, there is an idea which states that whatever it is that I am going through specifically at the moment, that thing seems to take on a disproportionate bias. So if, as an example, you ask people, what is the most uh, important thing uh, in a, that's going on in America today? Or what is you know the most difficult thing that's going on in America today? Often people will say, without hesitating now, the issue is the issues of race. That's the issue, racism. Because that's what we're going, on, going through now. Two, uh, two weeks ago, you would not have said racism. You might have said, uh, you know, healthcare, problems with healthcare. Problems with, uh, you know, with uh, hospitals' abilities to manage uh, burden. Because that's what you're going through in that moment. Whatever a person is going through at that moment is given disproportional weight for them to feel like, and that's why sometimes, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Shehakol Niyavet Baro. And that's why many times when a person is... Um, going through a difficult situation, so they can't think about anything else but that situation. It's not only because they're focused on that, but it's because their brain is telling them, this thing, this thing right here, it is the most important thing in the world. And even though it's not, but it's current, it's urgent, it's pressing. So it's made to feel much more important than actually what's going on around you. So Rabotai, I don't know about you, but I kind of feel like I need a bit of a break. I need a bit of a break from this. Because, you know, the title of the class was Loving Your Place. Loving where you are. Loving your situation. Loving the cards you were dealt. But that gets very difficult when the cards that we seem to be dealt are just pain and suffering and uh, quarantine and we're finally allowed out of our house and then there's curfews. It doesn't seem to end. So how does a person love their place when things are very difficult? How do I love my life situation? How does that, how does a person get themselves to that stage? Now, it's a very interesting thing, this, because I, I know, I don't know if any of you is, has as much of a joy as I have when it comes to, uh, when it comes to, uh, to doing other side jobs. Okay. I don't know if any of you has that. But like, I, I, have a wee, I enjoy making the flyers in the synagogue. I enjoy doing it, even though I probably shouldn't. There's probably better things for me to focus my time on. But I, I enjoy the creative endeavor. And every once in a while, you have a flyer or a, you know, a picture and a title which come together so seamlessly, so beautifully. And that's actually what happened today. So I don't know if you guys noticed the flyer, but the flyer was about four guys in a bobsled or in some countries known as a bobsleigh, okay? Because they're in a sleigh, not really in a sled. 
If you don't know the difference, um, you need to study more about Santa Claus. Either way, the point is, so in this bobsled, you have four people. And there's the front guy who's like plugged in in the zone with his wheel. Then the second guy who's number two in command. Then there's the third guy who's basically like looking out from the side of the bobsled, kind of like, what the heck? Like, what's going on here? How did I get in third place? How did I get passed over for the good job, for the front man job, right? I don't want, you know, you, nobody ever sees the face of the thir- bobsled rider number three, right? He's got two heads in front of him. It's impossible to ever see his contribution, what he's doing. And, and, um, and that flyer kind of sparked uh, uh, a, a little bit of, uh, of a creative thought process that I'd like to share with you tonight about how we love our place. How does one, how does one do that? Now, I don't know if you're uh, an avid follower of the parasha like I am, but uh, I seem to, I like to follow the, the parasha. Now, granted, it might not be your job. It is my job each week to know, you know, which parasha it is and as well to kind of talk and to communicate ideas of, of deep wisdom uh, from the Torah. So maybe, you know, it makes sense that I, I should be kind of maybe plugged into that uh, as you are maybe probably plugged into your job. But however... I want to focus with you on the beginning of our parasha, okay? Our parasha starts what seems to be a very fresh topic. And God speaks to Moshe saying, Raise up the head of B'nei Gershon, the children of Gershon. Also them, first word that should be a clue to you is the word also, okay? Also them, to their families, to their, to their, to their father's house, to their families. And it tells us about what they are supposed to be doing. And what does Gershon do? What is the work of Gershon? How do you raise his head? How do you make him feel good? How do you make him feel like he counts, like he has an important part to play? What do they have to do? The work of the Gershonite families to work and to carry. They shall carry the curtains of the Mishkan and the tabernacle, its cover and the screen, the different parts, the lace hangings, okay? All the ropes, the utensils of their service, all of these things, the Bnei Gershon, they carry all of these uh, elements that make up the outside of the Mishkan. You carry on in the parasha, a parasha named Parashat Naso, by the way. After this beginning, count them, make them feel like they count, get, raise, raise up their spirits. And then it continues and says, the very next element, sorry, and then it carries on, it says, excuse me, Zot Avodat Merari And now the children of Merari, and what is their job? And it tells you that their job is to take the planks, the walls of the tabernacle, not the coverings, the pillars, the sockets, etc., etc. Now, if you were to kind of cut in, in the middle of Parashat Naso, you might think that that's all the story of the carriers of the Mishkan. However, like they say on TV, previously on Naso, if you look first, and foremost, before the parasha that is called Nassau begins, right at the end of Parashat Bamidbar, the very last section in Parashat Bamidbar, you will see something fascinating. The Pasuk says, Vayidaber Hashem el Moshe el Aharon lemor, and God spoke to Moshe and to Aaron saying, Nassau et Rosh bene Kehat mitoch bene Levi. Last week's parasha. Identical. Literally the same words. Kind of takes the shine off our parashas Naso. The fact that, you know what, the leftovers of last week's parasha said the same thing. Naso raise up the tribe, the family of Bnei Kehat. And what do they carry? They carry the Aron HaKodesh. Okay? They carry the Shulchan. They carry the Mizbeach. Okay? They carry all of these wonderful Kelim of the Bet HaMikdash. Okay? I need you to understand something that to me is fascinating. And the question is, question number one, why in the world would we separate literally what seems to be a, a, an identical parasha portion? There's three sons, okay, of Kehat. One of them is Gershon, sorry, of, uh, of Levi. One of them is Gershon, Kehat, and Merari. Those are the three sons. In order, who's oldest? Gershon. 
Who is uh, is the one that comes first? Kehat. So number one, it's out of order. Number two, they put into two totally different parashiyot. Why is that? Why would we talk about Kehat first? End the parasha, start a brand new parasha as if we've never been here before. And, and, and tell us about raising up and counting the tribe of of Gershon, when they carry the, the coverings and the, you know, and the screen, etc., etc., etc. And the answer, my friends, is remarkable, okay? The Sepharim tell us something very, very special. And it kind of comes along with the understanding of loving your place. The Pasuk tells us, <clears throat> Naso et Rosh, says Rashi, Kemoshe Tziviticha al bene Kehat, just like I commanded you for the sons of Kehat. To count how many people there are that are working. I want you also to count them. Now, this is where it gets beautiful. Why did the sons of Gershon, why did they get the word Nassau? And why did the sons of Kehat get the word Nassau? If you look in the commentators, you'll see that the elevation, the raising up of the chin of Kehat, and the raising up of the chin of Gershon are fundamentally different. You know why Kehat comes first? Because Kehat is carrying the Aaron HaKodesh. He's carrying the holiest items from the temple. The Aaron which represents the study of Torah. All of that belongs to the son Kehat, but he's not the firstborn. Now it comes Gershon. Gershon should have been doing the most important job, but he doesn't do the most important job. Says the Pasuk, Let's begin with Gershon. Raise up Gershon's spirits. The firstborn son that feels like he was passed over. Make him understand that his job is important and as important as his younger brother who he was passed over for. If you look carefully, over here it says, Vayidaber Hashem el Moshe lemor. But when God commands the sons of Kehat, it says, And God spoke to Moshe ve'aharon lemor. Count the sons of Kehat. And one of the ideas that we're learning over here is that we're seeing the great reward that Amram got. Amram was the Gaon. He was the great scholar of the Jewish people. But we don't read anything about Amram. Go look, by the way, in the Torah. How many pesukim do we have with the great wisdom of Amram? Not much. In fact, not anything. Nothing. We hear from Yocheved, his wife. We hear from Miriam, his daughter. We hear from Moshe Rabenu. We hear from everybody. Amram, nothing. Surely the father of Moshe, Aharon, Miriam would have something smart to say. He's the leader of the whole generation. We don't hear anything from him. Amram is studying Torah. He's a tremendous Torah scholar. And although there are a lot of people that make a lot of noise, the Torah was teaching us over here that that's what happens when you're in Amram. When you have that much Torah study, even if nobody heard of you, even if you're the person in the back of the synagogue who studies and brings that home, those are the kids that you'll have. And if he has a Moshe and Aaron, and that comes from the line of Kehat, so Kehat is given the important job of carrying the Aaron. But I also thought, what a magnificent idea. Why is Gershon passed over? We just gave one idea. But there's a second idea that I always thought was fascinating. And that idea is, Rabbi Wattai, listen to this, gorgeous. If the oldest was given the crown... If the oldest was given the most important job, then everyone else might think that job belongs to the Bechor. I don't have an opportunity. I don't have a portion. I don't have a part. It's only him. He was given the job. I was not given the job. When a person doesn't feel like they have a part to play, they feel disenfranchised. They feel that that person is smarter, that person is better connected, that person had a better life experience. So for whatever reason, that person, not me, that person has the opportunity for growth. Suddenly, ladies and gentlemen, they feel like they can check out. 
So the Torah specifically took Kehat. And it said, Kehat, you carry the Aaron. You're the number two kid. Not the Bechor. You have to earn this. This is merit-based. It's a meritocracy. It doesn't go by who was born and who has a better last name. It goes by who puts in the effort. Isn't that beautiful? Now comes Gershom, but the Pasuk says, you know what? In order to teach you that lesson, I had to give it to Kehat. But let's make sure that Gershon doesn't get insulted by this. Let's raise him up and express to him how powerful and how important his job is as well. And now we understand why when the first child is given that extra job, right, get Kehat, who's actually not the firstborn. The Pasuk says, Vaidaber Amonai El Moshe. El Aharon, because Aharon was also an older brother that was passed over. And why was he passed over? Even though he was great, his job was going to be to be the Kohen Gadol. What an unbelievable job he was going to have for the Jewish community. And yet, God said, but Moshe, what about a second, Moshe, he's the one who's going to bring the Torah. He's the one who's going to bring the guidance. The reason why I think this is so important is because of the poster that I showed you. There's a lot of wisdom in loving one's place. There's a lot of wisdom that can be understood from a bobsled team. Now, for many of us in our childhood, you know, all we have is that one film that we saw as kids, you know, one for the, you remember that, right? Two foot, three foot, uh, that's what we remember, right? That's what we remember. Jamaica has a bobsled team. That's what we remember, okay? But I want to point out, that number three guy in the bobsled, <laughs> looking out like this in the photo, looking like he's been passed over, and not in the good holiday way, in the bad way, actually is incredibly important. And I want to share with you a lesson for life in loving your place, learned or culled from the bobsled team. Now, every person in the bobsled team has a specific role to play, be it the pilot or if he's the brake man or if he's a pusher. Each one has a very specific role to play. Now, I, you, what do we look at? We look at the bobsled. You see the guy turning the wheel. He's the man. But actually, it's not true at all. Because the person who's steering has one job. The person who's braking has the, another job. And the person who is a pusher, the pushers have a third job. And in order to understand this mashal and to learn the wisdom I'm trying to share with you from Gershon, Kehat, and Merari, I need you to come with me into the intimate workings of how a bobsled works. We're going to learn life wisdom from a bobsled. I bet you didn't think that was going to happen tonight, but that's what I like to do. I like to come here and then go, whoop, okay, now you're with me, all right? Let's check this out. Now, the person who's steering in the front of the bobsled, it's important that he, as he steers, he's supposed to ensure, obviously, that he doesn't crash into the wall. That's what he's supposed to do. But there's one incredible lesson that we learn from, that the pilot needs to learn. In bobsledding terms, they call it finding the line. What does that mean, finding the line? Now, if you know a bobsled track, it turns this way and it turns this way. But you know what? You don't have tires. All you have is these flat metal things that are sitting on ice. Now, if you've ever been in a car that's skidded on ice when you completely lose control, you know how helpless you feel? And that's with rubber tires that have grooves, not flat metal bottoms of a sled, not flat metal runners. So what happens when the person is turning on ice? You can go flying out of that wherever you need to go. So as you are turning, it's of course important not to turn too wide on a turn because you know what? Every inch that you go out is more track to cover. You don't get there as fast. So you want to take the fastest route to get to the end. However, if you take the fastest route, you know what happens? Sometimes if you're driving right in the middle, you don't go up the, the turn enough to be able to bring the force that the, the bobsled gets when it goes around the turn. That turn actually propels it. There's no engine on a bobsled. 
So everything you are using is the powers of gravity and the physics of, of pushing that bobsled to get as fast as it can. So the most important job of a steerer is, person who's doing the steering, is to find the line that gets you to the end, the fastest possible way, that takes on enough of a hill, but not too much. Don't oversteer and don't understeer. Isn't that fantastic? Don't oversteer and don't understeer. In every business, in every family, in every community, there are people who steer. Now, if you're a rabbi or a president of a synagogue or a CEO of a company or a father or a mother or a teacher in a classroom or an entrepreneur who's running their own coffee shop, right? When you're managing the people around you, it's imperative to understand you understeer chaos. You oversteer You've completely eliminated the free will of the people in your family. Sometimes you have children who decided that they are, that they are attempting to, uh, to fall in love, to marry somebody. And then the parent comes in and says, no, I didn't th- you're not marrying this person. I'll tell you who you're marrying, right? You got to understand, you, you know, you're not living with that person for the rest of your life. I know that you like this guy or this girl on paper, but I'm the one that I don't feel connected to them. Or I'm seeing their midot and I don't like the way that they act. So oversteering removes the possibility of any teamwork. And understeering in a family ensures that actually things get all over the place. You have to find the line. The job of the leader of the steerer, if you will, in the bobsled is to be able to have the vision to find the line and to guide the family, the business, the community, the enterprise, whatever it is that the guidance is doing. What is important for a steerer to have? What does he need to do his job well? He needs to have great eyesight, correct? He needs also to be able to have amazing hand-eye coordination, very important. Right? Because to do his job, it's imperative that he see the track. It's imperative that he notice every curve. It's imperative that he notice how fast and how much each turn. If I turn it just a little bit this way, how much does that make the bobsled slide? The job requires a very specific set of talents. Rabutai, we all know the back guy as well in bobsled. What is his job? His job is the brake man. Why? Because if the bobsled is going too fast into a turn, what happens? Fly out and people can get injured terribly. So it is the job of the brake man to sometimes hit the brakes. I want to share this with you. When I was a young man or a younger man setting up an organization called Chazak in London, so I was setting it up from nothing. I didn't have any partners, I didn't have anyone working with me, but I needed to build it. When you are building something from fresh, what do you need? You don't need no's, you need yeses. You need to say yes to every opportunity. It's not about constricting, it's not about tsum. it's about expansion. You need to get new customers, you need to get new target markets, you need to get into a new school, into a new synagogue. Everything is about expanding, doing more and more and more. So in the beginning, Bereshit, I said yes to everything. And then I took on a partner, my dear brother-in-law, Moshe Levi. And Moshe Levi is also a yes man. And then Yitzi David, we took on another yes man. And then I realized as the leader, you can't have an organization that has only people who are saying yes. You have to have someone who's hitting the brakes. You have to have someone who's going to say, we don't have the budget for this now. You have to have someone who's going to say, yes, I would love to teach Torah in that school also. But if our focus is working on the community that's not connected, maybe we shouldn't be in every single religious school. Because our greatest resource is our time. Maybe we need to say no. Initially, my partners thought after coming on to work and I had to become this no man, that that was who I was. I was a break man. But I wasn't. It wasn't who I was naturally. But that became my job. 
And if the people on my team were no people, they were people who were constantly negative, talking about how things would not work out, what's the response to that? To become a yes man. So the man in the front, the steering guy, he's giving direction to this uh, moving ship, this relationship, this uh, synagogue, this whatever. He's finding the direction. The brake man is the person that has to say, slow down. You want to do that also, and that also, and that also, and that also? We don't have the bandwidth. We don't have the resources. Rabbi, (laughs) you're going to fall apart. You need to take a break. That's the brake man. Again, what does the brake man need to be able to do? He needs to be able to communicate with the man in the front. He has to have great communication skills. Because if that guy is steering, he doesn't plan on going up the side. Brake man can't brake. He's going straight. He's taking off precious seconds for nothing. So he needs great communication. Steerer, the leader often, is someone who makes instinctive decisions. The breaker is someone who says, what are you doing? Where are you going? Let me compensate for where you're going so that this ship can be right. The father might be the tough guy. The mother might be full of love. One brother might be the one that tells this kid, the brother or the sister in the family, you know what, what you're doing is crazy. You're going to waste all your money. And then another brother might need to become the person, even if he's not naturally so, might need to take a place, a position in life, a position on this issue where he's telling him, go for it. The opposite, run. But there's a third set in, uh, in the bobsled. And I think... This is the most difficult. It is man number two and man number three. Known as pushers. Not because they push drugs if they get get depressed that they are not unnoticed. They are called pushers because it is their job to take this bobsled, which is incredibly heavy, and run from a dead stop from zero miles an hour as fast as they can. And then to be able to leap in as fast as they can, not to miss it, okay? They don't need, you could potentially have a pusher who was blind. Now you and I might think, okay, these guys are just running. What are they doing? They're wasting time. Absolutely not. Those guys, when they try out for the bobsled team, they do extensive, they do unbelievable amount of, what's it called? Of weight training. And they are unbelievable athletes with regards to running. And you'd think, what, you're just sitting there for alone for the ride. Not true at all. All of the speed of the bobsled comes from two things that the pusher has. Number one, his power in running, his ability to lift the, the sled. And number two, when he gets in, when he jumps into the bobsled and the person is steering, they all have to do this together and then this together. Every tiny bit of drag cuts it off. One-tenth of a second slower of a bobsled pusher in the back can result in losing a race. It makes so much of a difference. All of the speed is generated. Now, for me, it's unbelievable because the race is based on speed. And you and I would look at this bobsled and say the two, and number two and number three guy are completely irrelevant. But actually... If the race is built on speed, the guys who gave you the speed are the people you're calling irrelevant. Rabotai, in life, number two and number three guy, those are the people who are able to roll with the punches. Those are the people who are capable of leaning into someone else's leadership. I'm a huge fan of sports. And in this documentary about the last dance about Michael Jordan, you know, there was an extensive look into the role of the number two player on the Bulls whose name was Scottie Pippen. It is absolutely, it's undoubtable, if that's a word, (laughs) indubitable, yeah, to quote uh, uh, Warner Brothers. It is indubitable, yeah, it is indubitably so that you take Scottie Pippen out of the Bulls and... And, he, and Michael Jordan doesn't win championships. He needed someone that wasn't trying to pull in another direction. He needed someone who could recognize 
his skills to identify the fact that this man is the leader. And you know what? I don't need to fight for leadership. I need to play my role as best I can. And you know what? Then I'll be a champion. At the end, you don't crown one person champion when they win. Everyone gets a ring. Now, there might be one MVP. But you know what? If you ask any sportsman, would they rather be MVP or share a ring with the whole team? Would you have a singular win or a group win? What would you choose? There's not a single person out there that would choose to be MVP and to lose the championship. That is the nature of being part of a team. And indeed, every single human being on earth is part of some team. That team might be your family. It might be at work. It might be a group of best friends. Every person has a role to play even in a group of friends. They have a role to play in the family. And sometimes you get to be your natural self. Sometimes. But sometimes there's another person whose natural self is so strong and they're incapable of change. And you have to ask yourself, do I want to be MVP and write and watch the bobsled crash? Or do I want to lean into their turn? Remember, the difference between winning and losing is one-tenth of a second. One ounce of hesitation. The difference between shalom bait and fighting with your wife might be a tiny bit of a smile. Where you went like this, or you went like this. Whether you smiled and it got to your eyes, or it got just short. So it was obvious that you weren't really happy with how things turned out. Or that you're not so happy with her. Or when someone says, your wife is the best, and you're like, and she looks at you. Our wives know our faces. <laughs> one-tenth of a second. One-tenth of a millimeter. That is the difference between the brake man, the pusher, and the steerer. Everybody's got their thing. Sometimes a brake man realizes that the most important thing in the race is speed until you crash. And then the worst thing in the world is speed. Because for every extra mile an hour you're going, that's how bad the crash becomes. That's how much the loss of control ruins your story. Now, I want to share with you. What's interesting to me about the bobsled analogy is that at the Olympics... Success or failure is not judged by one run. In fact, there's four separate runs. They're called heats. And they average out. They calculate the aggregate number over those four runs. And they see who is the winner. Families are about a journey. Businesses are never, almost never decided in one business deal. So if you tried and it didn't work, don't assume that that's it. Ultimately, the future of a business is not decided by one. It's decided by how you are each and every day. And on aggregate, are you a profitable business or not profitable? You might have made a terrible choice. I spoke a little while ago to a person in real estate who made a bad real real estate decision. And you know what he said to me? He said, sometimes you got to know. You got to realize You're not going to win every deal. You're not going to win it. And because you're not going to win every deal, instead of pouring more money in and more money in and more money in, have the humility to say, I oversteered. I oversteered. What do I have to do now? Right now, my only job is to finish the race, to get out of this race. How do I beat that? How do I win now? Focus on the next one. I see this in people who are dating all the time. They put in a tremendous effort into one dating scenario. It doesn't go well. And they say, I'm done with dating. What do you mean done with dating? What does that mean? You don't date dating. You date people. (laughs) You don't date systems. You know, shidduch systems. Uh, You know, speed dating systems. You date people. 
and you only need one. So it didn't work with this one. Okay, it was about the next one. Let's move to the next one. The deal didn't work. What about the next one? What's fascinating to me is that there is a tribe called Kehat amongst the sons of Levi. And they are given, what are they given? They're given the greatest opportunity. The opportunity to carry the Aron Kodesh. And God says to Moshe, careful now. Because there's another son here. And if he doesn't have the best job, he's going to think that he has no job. Help him understand that if they get to wherever you're going with the Aaron and the Shulchan and the Mizbeach and everything that they carried, but they don't have the screens, there's no Mishkan and there's no Korbanot and there's no Yom Kippur. Help B'nai Mirari understand the same thing. Help them realize that if they're a brake man, if they're a pusher, if they're a steerer, you have your place, you have your job, and your job is unlike anybody else's. And it requires different things to push you in different directions. Now, I want to share something with you. You know, one of the, the little known things about, uh, about uh, bobsleds is that The challenge to speed comes in friction. How much friction is there between the metal and the ice? And therefore, there's a specific amount of weight that is allowed in any given bobsled because the heavier the bobsled is, the more momentum it has. Because that extra mass, you know what happens? It just pushes through the friction, the gravity and friction. That's all that there is. That's, that's the entire menu over here. It's not a Chinese menu where there's 74 options and each option you could get in duck and chicken and meat and what things that identify as meat, okay? There's very few variables, but the variables need to be put together painstakingly. People will win or lose races by hundredths of a second. So... The weight of the pusher as he sits inside, even when it looks like he's doing nothing. The steerer is steering. The brake man is braking. I'm not even leaning. It's not Pesach. We're not at a curve. I'm doing nothing. Not true. Your weight is pushing this bobsled even if you're not aware of it. Because when you look at that steerer and you think he's the hero, and you think others think he's the hero, you look at a rabbi who might be changing a community. You look at a principal who's guiding a school to success or a university. You look at a CEO. That CEO is nothing, 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 (laughs) nothing without the people who are there for the ride who trust them enough to get in the bobsled with them in the first place, who will follow their direction into battle, into working and building the community. Never, never disrespect the people sitting behind you, the people sitting with you, even if they're doing nothing for you. Sometimes a person is capable of getting through things by one measure and one measure alone. The Pasuk tells us <clears throat> about HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Gam ki elech begei tzal mavet lo 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 irara I'm walking in the valley of the shadow of death. I'm afraid of no evil. Why? Why? Ki ata imadi. Because Hashem, because you're with me. And one of my favorite ideas in Torah is to point out, the pasuk does not say, since Hashem is with you, nothing bad happens. That is untrue. It's a fallacy of a naive understanding of emunah. That if I believe in God, nothing bad happens. Bad things happen. They don't turn out to be bad in the final analysis. But people get sick. 
and people die and people lose their jobs and people's marriages fall apart. Terrible things happen. God is with you in the valley of the shadow of death. You are still in the valley of the shadow of death. What does lo irara mean then? It means that human beings are capable of achieving incredible things with one caveat. Ki ata imadi. That they do not feel alone. Wow. Two, three? You think you're nothing? You're with me. One of the things that many rabbis have told me over this time is that they struggled tremendously, tremendously to teach Torah in this environment. You know why? Because when you're giving a class, you're feeding off the energy of the people that are sitting there. You know, I don't know if you understand this. I don't know how many of you have done public speaking before, but it's a very disconcerting thing. It's a very disconcerting thing to make a joke and to hear nobody laugh. That's a very disconcerting thing. You're not sure. Like, am I not funny at all? Like, did no one, did that not land? Right? You know, can we get a round of applause? No, you know, silent applause, you see, on muted Zooms. Right? So this rabbi told me, he says, I'm struggling so much. I'm struggling so much to be able to give classes. Why? Because I don't have the energy of the people. And I just started laughing. Why? Because this rabbi is a very famous rabbi, a very famous speaker. And just that day, I was speaking to a, a, a young woman who was telling me that she's struggling so much with mental health during Corona. She's struggling. She's having all sorts of terrible thoughts. She's, you know, she feels trapped. She's claustrophobic. The family is also, they don't get along so well. So she's not in curfew. She's not in quarantine. She's in hell. (laughs) And she says, Rabbi, you know what got me through all this time? She says, there's this rabbi And I used to go to his classes in Brooklyn. And you know what, Rabbi? She said, I'm the type of person that I sit at home, I'm like a couch potato. I always love that. Like you blame the couch. How's eat the couch? (laughs) It's got nothing to do with the couch. Don't bring the couch into this. You're also a bed potato, right? And a floor potato. You're just a potato. You're Ashkenaz. It's a staple of your diet. You are a potato. Let's just go. Come on. Identify with it. All right? Now listen to this. She said, so all the time, my biggest struggle was always the fact that I never had the energy to get up and go, to get up and do, to get up and change, you know, my situation, to figure out how to change the dynamic with my parents, to figure out how to go get involved with my friends. You know, I just sat here feeling sorry for myself. Nobody calls me. Nobody cares about me. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. That is the story of my life. I didn't have the energy. But then I, I would go to this rabbi's classes and I feel so much energy and I'd be laughing and I'd be clapping and I'd go out and i feel so excited. She says, I'm still drawing on that energy of those classes from before Corona. So I'm finding it difficult. He's not online. I don't know what's going on with him. So first of all, I said to him, dude, do you understand this? I just, this morning, this girl is telling me that it was your classes that are getting her through. She needs you. She's missing your energy online. But I thought of something else, which actually, um, which I think is a very subtle point. This girl gets so much energy from the rabbi's class. Where he's telling her about how she matters and how she can and how everything is possible and if she has emunash and will help her and you know and you know she's so special and she's the son of Abraham Yitzhak and Yaakov and she's got a little bit of Nachshon ben Aminadav inside of her. She's getting energy from him. Why is the rabbi not online? Because he can't get energy without being in front of the crowd of evil. 
Are you seeing this hilarious, ironic cycle? She's drawing energy from his ideas, from his wisdom, from his passion, from his excitement. And where's his excitement come from? Her and everyone else sitting in front of them. So who brings excitement? Who brings energy? Who brings passion? If she points at him and he points at her, at the crowd, who is generating this? It is the beautiful symbiosis of a leader, of someone who is a steerer by nature and someone who is a pusher by nature. Someone who jumps on board and says, Rabbi, I'm listening. I don't know if you know, it's so funny. Every, people don't think that a rabbi needs inspiration because he's giving it all the time. But it, is, it comes from everybody in front of me. It comes from the messages that people send about how much it matters, how they tune in every night. You know, I don't, can't explain to you how much energy I get when I see a picture someone sends me, a flat screen TV, and instead of whatever batikh they were going to watch on it instead, Thursday night, they're watching Rabbi Fari on a 60-inch screen. Okay? Who's there? The whole family with popcorn. <laughs> you feel like what you're giving matters, so you give more. I'm telling you as a rabbi that when you're sitting in your chair... On your abo, you're providing the energy that the energy giver is giving back to you. That is the cycle of a family, of a business. Identify the people around you. Are they steerers? Are they breakers? Are they pushers? What's missing in my family unit, in my business, in my community? What do I need to be here? And I want to share with you what happens when leaders are clever and plugged in and clued in uh, to this reality, okay? It is late at night and a uh, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Ruvain Feinstein's phone rings Thursday night. Maybe it was Friday, I don't remember. He goes to the phone and a uh, woman's voice is on the phone. Hi, this is Mrs. Goldberg. You know, And she says, can you tell me what time it is? The, the Shabbat candle is what time do we light the Shabbat candles? He's just one of the great rabbis of the generation. Elderly woman's calling him Friday afternoon. You know, what time is the Shabbat candles? So he's a little surprised that she's calling him about, you know, you know one of my favorite... Uh, um, abbreviations in text and in, you know, online is L M G T Y. I think I skipped an F in there, but right. What does that stand for? Let me Google that for you. <laughs> Rabbi, what day is Rosh Hashanah? Get in there. You know, you know what? It's amazing. When you Google that, you don't even need to look down in the search results. It like, it's part of Google's own search results. Like they answer that question. Siri, <laughs> what day is Rosh Hashanah? You got your answer. You don't need the rabbi. Anyway, so Rav Ruvain Feinstein is sitting there Friday afternoon, getting out of the bath like Hillel, wrapping his hair, doing his, uh, you know, his nails. And she, what time is the Shabbat? What does she do? She responds. He responds, he tells her what time Shabbat is. A week goes by. Friday afternoon. Ring, ring. Hello, it's Mrs. Goldberg. <laughs> what time is the Shabbat candles? And Rav Ruven says, um, Ma'am, you know, you don't have to call me each week. In the, Jews, in the Judaica store, they have something called a luach, a calendar. And it, it, like it has printed all of the Shabbat times, not only for the entire year, but for like the next 20 years, there's even one. There's one for 120 years. So the woman says, are you ready? Drum roll, please. She says, oh my gosh. I can't believe it. There's a luach? I can look at myself. 
Ready? Because for 15 years, I called your father, Rev Moshe Feinstein, every single week. And he gave me the times each week. And he never told me about a luach. Dun, dun, dun! <laughs> who feels like a dip now? His father who led the whole generation. Rev Moshe Feinstein was the greatest scholar of his era. Here, anywhere in the world, okay? And he had time for a widow who didn't know what time Shabbat candles were. And now he passes away and she calls the son and the son picks up the phone and after one week, he's pointing her off on a luach. Call me each week. Please, call me each week. I think what the rabbi noticed in that moment was that he was trying to do one or be one type of leader when actually what was necessary was another. Rev Moshe also knew about Luachs. But Rev Moshe understood, being the great leader that he was, that this woman was calling and it made her weak when she got a chance to speak to the rabbi. Even if it was only a simple question like, what time do we light the Shabbat candles? But the next generation down, as great as they were, didn't have that sensitivity. So instead of leaning into the question, instead they hit the brakes and tried to figure out a way where they wouldn't have to answer that question again. And I don't think he was being cruel. He was being practical. But I'm sure after hearing what his father's response was, he understood that there was another role that he needed to play for her. I'll give you one more example. Rav Shlomo Zalman Arbach was one of the most special Jews that lived in the last hundred years. Wise, kind, full of unbelievable wisdom, incredible shoulders, taught us how to love our wives. Oh my gosh. They should make a movie about the relationship between Shlomo Zalman Arbach and his wife. We would all learn uh, a tremendous amount from binge-watching every second of a reality TV show called The Life and Times of the Marriage of Rav Shlomo Zalman Arbach. He was unbelievable. We've spoken about him many times in the shul. Rav Shlomo Zalman Arbach arrives at a wedding. He's supposed to be, he has the highest honor at the wedding, which is to arrange the marriage, Misader Kiddushin, big honor, to be the rabbi that's marrying the couple. That's the biggest honor. He gets up on the, the stage and before everything starts, he says, okay, who are the different people? What's going on? Who are the edim? Who are the witnesses to witness the Kiddushin? They say to him, well, it's this person and also this, this person. The rabbi He knew that person, and he knew that because of his background, he actually was not kosher to be an ed. He was not kosher to be a witness. But what do you do now? He's already been told that he's going to be a witness at the wedding. He's going to be humiliated. He's going to be upset. It will be obvious that the rabbi thought that he was not appropriate to be the ed, the witness. If Shlomo Zalman walks down the aisle, taps the would-be witness on the shoulder. And he says, my dear friend, I heard that you were supposed to be a witness, he said. But you are such a special person. And he highlighted all the wonderful things that that person had about him that were good. Except for the thing that made him pasul as an ed, as a witness. And he said, I feel that it is a disrespect to you that you were only a witness You should be given the highest honor. You should be arranging the whole marriage. Guys, what are you talking about? You're the great rabbi. I'm a small rabbi. I don't really this, that, the other. He says, no, no, I refuse. I absolutely refuse, says the rabbi. It's got to be you. Okay, if the rabbi thinks that, you're telling me I have to do it. Okay, sure. He goes up and the rabbi is standing next to him as an ear, in his ear, communicating to him as clearly as he can everything that he needs to do to run the wedding and he hands over the reins of the Sidur Kiddushin to this man in order to be able to allow him to feel 
like he got everything that he needed that night and that he wasn't passed over. In that moment, Rav Shlomo Zalman understood that instead of being a person who would hit the brakes, no, can't be an ed, humiliate him in front of hundreds of people. He understood that the job there was to steer, to figure out how to navigate around the problem instead of smashing through it. Unfortunately, quite often people don't know how to do that. They have a disagreement with a child, with a worker, even if it's someone who's not, uh, you know, on your quote-unquote level in the business. And they take the fight on, and they go smack at each other, and they wind up destroying what could have been good by a little bit of navigation. You know, the Bechor Shor writes that in the end of the parasha, we find an identical idea, and we'll end with this. This parasha is famous for being one of the longest parashiyot. And it is very long, the longest. And why is it so long? Because it has a portion in it, which is just literally double talk. And it begins by telling us that the korban of each nasi, each leader came to bring a korban to dedicate the mishkan. And then it goes, korban, oh, karat, kesef, ahat, right, mishkal, echad. It goes through and they gave, each one of the 12 nasim gave an identical korban. And yet, the Torah goes through each and every one of their korbanot. It says it again and again and again. All it needed to say was, and this is the korban, and all of them gave it. They each gave one. And the lesson, Rabotai, is, the pasuk says, and the Bechor Shor explains, in order that none of them should be jealous of one another, we learn that sometimes it's worth speaking something out and through in order to be able to communicate the idea in the best possible way. You know, I want to share with you, Rabotai, that I think that for each and every one of us, this is a incredible part of the job that we need to do. It is a crucial part of the job that we need to do on behalf of one another. It's to be able to recognize that sometimes I don't win the race this time. But if I give him the time and if I don't make him jealous and if I make him feel like he's valuable and his opinion and his ideas and his emotions are heard, are valued, even if I can't give in. I'm there along with him for the ride. And that becomes enough. And we win the next race, even if this one is shot already. I hope and I pray that each one of us can learn to play the roles that we have, and to recognize that no matter what we go through in life and where we find ourselves, whatever station, whatever position, whatever title, that role was hand-selected for you by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And God says, even if you don't like the one that you've got, it's the one that I gave you. And if you feel like it's not good enough, it's almost always because you think that it's a worse job than the other person. He can't do his without yours. And you can't do yours without his. So who's powering who? I hope that each and every one of us can take this lesson and be the very best we can be in each of the many positions that we hold in this wonderful interconnected world that we call life. Shabbat Shalom.